Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. I have great sympathy for Tuvalu and the Marshall Islands and others because I spent 10 years advising those countries when I was at SPC and setting up SPREP many years ago. So I've been arguing this issue for a very long time in that part of the world as well. Uh, and I think when we come to look at this issue, we have to really see that we're not just talking about some issues of climate and what it may do. We're not just talking about some issues of energy. We're really talking about things so fundamental that they're challenging the whole future of our civilization. Because these are all interrelated issues. None of them can be separated one from the other. We're facing very difficult choices. Either we can go ahead, business will burn the fossil fuels until we exhaust them. And the Stern Report says that will cost $660 billion a year and you know, decrease the GDP globally by 5 to 20 percent. Or we can say we must stop burning fossil fuels now to save the climate. And because there's not enough energy to keep society functioning, that will produce an enormous economic collapse internationally in our present civilization and raises issues about how do we feed the six billion people on this planet, which, where we, which we, the population has grown because modern agriculture with all the subsidies of, of fossil fuels and fertilizers and so on, fossil fuels, have allowed us to raise agricultural productivity. We have extremely difficult challenges ahead. None of them are going to be easy, and it's no wonder that we cannot deal with these only at the economic level. The economic system has failed to deal with this issue. You know, this is the greatest market failure in the history of the planet. The costs that are coming have not been factored into the economic system. It's been ignored. We've seen the political system has not resolved. We have, from Stockholm to Rio and so on, made declarations, adopted action plans. We keep tripping on the implementation. We're not moving far enough and fast enough at the political level. Scientific information, the scientists have been saying for years, this is coming. But as you've already seen with the examples of smoking and others, does science make you change your behavior? <coughs> you can know intellectually about a problem, it doesn't make the changes that are needed. So fundamentally, we have to take the debate to a much deeper level in all of society, which is the level of ethics and values. And it's only at that level that we have a chance of making people change their behavior, of institutions changing their behavior, and gra uh, responding at the scale of the problem that we are facing. Because this is, this is a problem, we, we occasionally have a disaster in one country or another, we go to help that country. This is a disaster that's happening simultaneously in all the countries of the world. We've never seen something at this scale before. If sea levels rise at the rate they're now predicting, we may see hundreds of millions of refugees. Where will they go? Who will take them in? What does this mean about immigration regulations and visas and work permits and all of those things that governments presently use now to protect themselves? The moral issues that would come, if agriculture collapses, as they're suggesting may happen, because they say, for instance, that the grain-growing regions in North America may shift from the United States to the middle of north of Canada. Now, what does this mean in terms of food supplies? Does that steak on your plate mean somebody else starving to death because there's not enough food to feed the cows that, you know, that you're eating the steak from? And so on. These, these issues are going to become fundamentally important for people all around the world at the same time. So we really have to say, how do we do find the complement to science necessary to deal with this issue? You know, how do we motivate people to want to change? How do we create a willingness to make the sacrifices that are going to be necessary, that we cannot do without? How do we build a sense of global solidarity when we're all facing the same common challenges? Whether it be through trying to mitigate the problem, as I mentioned, which will produce enormous economic effects from, from making a rapid shift from our use of fossil fuels, or trying to adapt, where we have nations vanishing, you know, populations being uprooted, economic activities shifted over very large distances, uh, the need to abandon many coastal areas, including large cities, so on. We're looking at a scale of change over the next you know, 100 years or so that is really frighteningly large. And therefore, we need to say, how do we build a new foundation for wanting to work together on this problem? How do we get back to that original spirit of the United Nations in 1945, 
when after the disaster of World War II, the says, we must create mechanisms strong enough to prevent war between countries. It's that kind of effort that is going to be needed to face the problem that is coming. And therefore, we have to acknowledge our common humanity. We have to build that sense of unity, which is fundamentally an ethical, a moral issue. We are all part of the same human race, facing the same set of challenges. This also raises fundamental questions about our economic system. Because our economic system, there's nothing wrong with market mechanisms and the machinery. It's the values behind the system that have to be questioned. Because our economic system does not see any limits to nature's capacity to absorb greenhouse gases, for instance. It does not see that natural resources you know, are part of capital. They're simply free goods to be taken and exploited you know, to, to make money. Uh, we have an, we give this absolute value to growth, to expansion, to, uh, to the material side of life, and don't regard the other dimensions of development that most people in the world say are important. Culture, beauty, art, spirituality, these are things that people say are important. They are not factored into the economic equations. So we have an economic system that has this dogmatic materialism in which a small minority benefits from the economic system while the vast majority of the population is still not really part of the system. When you consider that more than half the human race is trying to live on less than two euros a day, when the European Union gives that much to every cow every day, we have distortions in our society that must be addressed. So we have to put much more of an emphasis on education for sustainable development, because it's at education level that we can deal with issues of values, issues of morals. And of course, the role of NGOs in this area is very important. Governments only have part of the responsibility. It is shared across all segments of society, including the role of religion. Religion is, of course, that dimension of society that has traditionally been responsible for the moral and ethical dimension. Unfortunately, too often, religion today has, because people are so desperate to cling to something, has been drifting into fanaticism, extremism, you know, basis of disunity. Religion was intended to be a source of unity. We need to get back to that original purpose of that motivation and say, what are the sources of unity that allow us to rise above these challenges? How do we move away from a culture of conflict to a culture of collaboration? How do we strengthen the role of justice? Because if there's not justice, people won't cooperate. If somebody says, I'm getting all the benefit, you make the sacrifice, you will never get any kind of collaboration. We have to learn to trust each other. We have to, you know, how many politicians are trusted in the world today? You know, we need to build a level of trust to build the agreements to work together. We need to look at moderation. As long as we push civilization and the materialism to an extreme, we go beyond the planetary limits. And all religions have taught about being content with little, little, giving priority to other things than just the material side of life. Again, a very important moral, ethical dimension to bring into this debate that we don't hear often enough. And of course, sustainable development itself is an ethical concept, being responsible for our fellow human beings of this generation and of future generations. So I think, I'll just in closing, we need to say we are facing enormous challenges but it's not a time to bury our head in the sand. We have to say, yes, this is an opportunity to make those basic changes in society that we've been avoiding for the last 50 years. This is an opportunity to say, it's going to be a challenge, particularly for the young people. You know, we can build something new. We can build a new kind of economics that is more altruistic, that really addresses issues of poverty, that creates employment for everybody. We can this is an opportunity to, that we can turn our society away from its exploitative destruction of the natural environment towards a much more sustainable form of using resources for the benefit of present and future generations. And I think this is an area where we now to say, we have the challenges, let us rise to the challenge in a positive sense and work together to build the ethical and moral foundations for moving ahead and solving the issues. Thank you very much.